20th Psalm, You, O God, have been our dwelling place for all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you informed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are our God. Jesus said, I am the, re the, the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, before whom the generations rise and pass away, even in the presence of death, our first words to you are in praise for your unnumbered mercies. God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our sister Margaret. We thank you for giving her to us, to this family, to these friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, Lord, console those who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course here on earth, until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're gathered here today to hear God's words of hope as we commemorate with thanksgiving the life of Ruth Margaret Lang. Ruth was born, Ruth Margaret is in the church, she's been known as Margaret, was born in Germany on August 14, 1925, to Lydia Eichhorst and her husband, whose name most of us don't know or none of us knows. Shortly after her birth, her parents divorced. Because her mother had to work to support the two of them, Margaret lived alternatively with her mother or her maternal grandparents until the age of 12, when her mother married Herman Driesner, a widower and farmer with three small children. They lived a typical, peaceful farm life in the village of Linde in East Prussia until the outbreak of World War II. Three times during the war, Herman was called into active duty in the German army as a medic. The remainder of the time, he farmed the land to help provide food for the troops. As the war was coming to an end, the entire family, along with millions of other refugees, had to flee for their lives from Russian invaders, traveling in midwinter sub-freezing conditions along the snow-covered trails, crossing frozen rivers and streams, and taking with them only the barest of necessities. Her maternal grandmother died along the way. Somehow, through the grace of God, Margaret, her parents, and her seven siblings all survived the trek, finally settling in Neuburg, East Frisia, where they farmed for several years before moving to Middles, Oosterwald. Am I even close on this one? Okay. <laughs> where they made a living uh, from a small rental farm. Margaret was 19 when the war ended in 1945. She had hopes of a life like any other 19-year-old girl, marriage, perhaps children. But because of the war, there were just no marriageable-aged young men left alive to court her. Finally, in 1951, she threw caution to the winds and accepted an offer to be an au pair for a Canadian couple under a program sponsored by the Canadian government, which agreed to pay her passage by ship if she would stay and work for the couple for two years. Once in Canada, and after completing her required work obligation, she met and married a fellow German refugee named Harry Hanke. Harry was a bigger-than-life character who wanted to live in a bigger-than-life place, so the two of them moved to California and purchased a condo from which the Hollywood sign was visible through their picture window. To help make ends meet, Margaret went to the nearest Wells Fargo bank and offered her services as a teller. Although she didn't have the proper credentials for the job, the manager wisely hired her anyway. Margaret made her way up through their system until she was appointed as the supervisor of all of the tellers. She made herself so indispensable that when the time came for her to retire, they kept calling her back to work. So she worked at that facility until she was in her mid-70s. She and Harry attended the Presbyterian Church there, where they served as deacons, ushers, and held other positions of authority. She and Harry enjoyed a pleasant life together, making memorable trips to Hawaii and various other locales. They often vacationed at a timeshare they had at Lawrence Welk Village. However, her beloved Harry died of cancer in 2003. Wanting to spend her final years in the bosom of her family, Shortly thereafter, Margaret sold off all of her furniture and moved here to Highland, Illinois, where she lived from 2005 
until 2021 in a small apartment at the corner of Laurel and 9th Street, where she made friends with everybody except the man who did the gardening before she lived there, from what I understand. <laughs> she meticulously tended to the flowers and the shrubs and the gardens of the complex. She immediately joined and became active here at First Baptist Church, serving on social committee and actively participating in our women's ministry. She also served as worship leader at our monthly Sunday evening services at the Highland Home. She arranged for birthday, anniversary, get well, and other cards to be sent to church members and Highland Home residents. She also worked for a time at our local food pantry, helping distribute food and recruiting volunteers from church to help her. Within the past few years, health issues caused her to give up these jobs, but she remained faithful, active, here at the church to the end of her life. In August of 2021, poor eyesight forced her to change residences, and she moved to the Highland home, where she spent her remaining months happily living among the wonderfully caring, friendly, and supportive staff and residents there. After suffering several recent cardiac-related health setbacks, she died peacefully in her bedroom on last Friday, and her soul now lives eternally with Christ, who is so precious to her. This is why we're gathered today to celebrate the life, the faith, and the legacy of Margaret. We go now to our scriptures, and our first scripture reading comes from Christina. <clears throat> But she also included always a Bible verse in the side to help um, make the card more special. And I kept many of the ones that she sent to me, and she also kept many of the ones that were sent to her from various family members and friends. And um, so the reason I'm mentioning that is because um, my cousin Rosalie cannot be here, but her, the card was discovered from her that Aunt Margaret had gone to that she sent to her. And the message from my cousin says, Dear Aunt Margaret, I hope this note finds you doing well. Just like flowers, you have, <clears throat> you have always brightened up a room and brought the joy of laughter to those around you. Love you very much, Rosalie. And inside the card is the Bible verse that I was asked to read. So nice juxtaposition there. The verse comes from Psalm 19, it's verse 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they have used no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. I have for you, 
Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now, if you would stand as you're comfortably able, we'll sing together, Our Mighty Fortress is Our God. But here's the catch the first time through, we can turn it at my seven. So, yes, if you look at your uh, Celebration Black Pamphlet on the very back, if you look at it, you'll see the German there is the Almighty Fortress. Now, so there are some here who not only can read this, but understand it. So if you do sing with vigor, if you can at least pronounce this, also sing with vigor. If you have no idea what any of these words mean, make a joyful noise. <laughs> so, let's do this.
was shared with me that were some of Margate's favorites, and so I'm going to share those. And I threw in a couple others. And last night, as I was thinking about this, I was like, "Am I putting in too much scripture?" But I'm pretty sure for her, I can do that. So um, hopefully, she won't be pleased with what I share. Um, so my very first memory of uh, my aunt, because uh, she, you know, lived in California, so uh, we only saw her once a year for um, my childhood, and. I think my first memory, I was, I was probably eight or nine, and um, it was around Mother's Day because she was here, and everyone was over at Oma's house, and I walked out on the porch from whatever nonsense I was up to, and threw myself in the chair, um, and I remember her uh, scolding me because that was not very ladylike. <laughs> I had not said that very properly. I was throwing myself about and probably had one leg thrown over an arm. And, um, and I remember being like, I did not say these words out of my mouth, but looking at her and being like, who are you to tell me what to do? You're not a mom. Um, and I, I think I always thought about that often because fortunately I got to learn um, who she was. Um, but I was stubborn, I don't know where I got that from. Um, <laughs> and I want to share with you um, kind of a compilation of scriptures that Margie had um, as some that were her favorite. Don't be impatient. Take heart. Don't quit. Wait for the Lord and he will come and save you. Be brave, stout-hearted, and courageous. I'll say it again. Wait and God will help you. So take a new grip with your tired hands. Stand firm on your shaky legs. And mark out a straight, smooth path for your feet. In quietness and confidence is your strength. Blessed are all those who wait for the Lord to help you. This is compiled in passages of Psalms 27, 14, Hebrews 12, 12, and Isaiah 30, 15, 18. So let me share with you just a little bit about who I feel like Margie was. She was a daughter. She was a daughter of an amazing woman who certainly set the standard for us all. And I think that some lessons that Margie learned from being a daughter to that woman was that that God has a plan for your life and that not to be afraid of the circumstances that you are put within. And because that was modeled to her from a very young age to pursue the path that was put before her. She was a sister. She was a big sister to nine younger brothers and sisters. Um, I was the youngest in my family, so I am partial to the baby. But um, she was able to have a relationship with each of them that was special and unique. And that there's a large age span <laughs> amongst them, but she invested um, in that relationship and was a model for them. Um, I was thinking back a lot this week on her, um, just still looking at pictures and and just thinking about her life as a teenager. And growing up in our family, we are all like have the story of our family kind of ingrained in us. But I have always kind of thought of it more from like the younger side because my dad is on the younger side of the family. But thinking about what Margie's experience was as a teen and the faith that she had to hold. She was 19 when she was fleeing for her life with her parents and her grandparents and her siblings. And at the age of 19, you're fully aware of the world, of the circumstances around you and the, the, the danger and the threat. And I just think of the bravery that they all had, but like, particularly at like that stage of life, for her to be able to be whatever was needed of her. Which kind of brings me to the lyrics of a song that, in my mind, my life was a musical. And um, I was driving here this morning listening, and I felt like the lyrics of this song just really um, spoke a lot to her, not only from those teenage years, but through all of her life. Songs by Meredith Andrews and it's 
You were reaching through the storm, walking on the water, even when I could not see. In the middle of it all, when I thought you were a thousand miles away, not for a moment did you forsake me. Not for a moment did you forsake me. After all, you are constant. After all, you are only good. After all, you are sovereign. Not for a moment did you forsake me. You were singing in the dark, whispering your promise, even when I could not hear. I was held in your arms, carried for a thousand miles to show. Not for a moment did you forsake me. Margie was also a realist. She was a wonderful combination of a realist and an adventurer and a wife. She survived the flight and realized that to have a future, she had to be brave and she had to leave her family and where she was so that she could pursue what she was to be. And she moved across an ocean. And I think now, like, we don't always think about that. Like, that's a big deal now, but like, we don't always think about how big of a deal it was at that time to leave everything, everything that you know, and go and just in the hope and in the faith that God would have what you needed. And he did have what she needed. She met Harry, who was also an adventurer. And then they moved across the continent again, where they pursued life. They were always faithful. They invested in their community and in their church and in the people around them, being a bright light. And they had adventures together. And they lived every day that they were given. And then she was brave again after Harry passed. And so she was, and I don't know, it was like not quite 20 years. So 17 years ago, yeah. 17 years ago. She sold all of her stuff, not all of it, but most of it. And moved across country again. I mean, this time she knew she was coming to family. But again, picking up, moving pursuing the next step and knowing that God would be with her and guiding her and helping her to find her space here. And she found it. She was an aunt. Um, I hadn't really thought until this week when I was talking to one of my aunts about the timing. And so Margie moved back here about the same time that my family and my husband and children and I moved back here. And when I looked back at pictures this week of just all of the things that she was all of the places that she was, and, you know, holding a birthday parties for my kids, where like there's kids running around and being loud and toys everywhere, and she's she's there with us. And then she went on cruises, and she went on trips to see family, and she went on trips to see anything, and she just continued to live each day and know that there was something in each day that. God had for her and that she could do. Another favorite scripture of Marie, Marie says, It shall come to pass that before they shall call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. Which Isaiah, it's from Isaiah 64 24. Um, some of the lessons that I learned from Marie are that life's not fair, it isn't for anybody. Nobody gets the easy part. <laughs> But it's a whole lot better if you accept it and move forward. And you don't get stuck in it. Because you can live forever feeling sorry for yourself. See the gifts that you're given. Look around you and see the blessings that you have. And use those for others. Truly be where you are. When I think about her life, I feel like she was present in every circumstance that she was put in. She wasn't always looking for the next thing or like how to how to move on from where she was. She was where she was, and she fully embraced it. And I think that that's something that's hard to do. It's hard to do for me sometimes, but it's such a wonderful way to live. 
was a verse that I wanted to share um, from Romans 8, 37 through 39. Now in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. There's a poem that Marty had that I'm going to share with you. And it kind of reminds me of something that a pastor said at the end of one of my other hands um, funerals about how we can all, we are a wonderful close family, but we can all only go so far together. So the title of this poem is Miss Me Will Let Me Go. When I come to the end of the road and the sun has set for me, I want no rights in a gloom-filled room. Why cry for a soul set free? Miss me a little, but not too long, and not with your head bowed low. Remember the love that we once shared. Miss me, but let me go. For this journey we all must take, and each must go along. It's all a part of the master's plan. Miss me.
to read from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. From the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power to the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have to have suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith a greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. For me, Aunt Margie, when I think about her, the person that comes to mind in Scripture says Anna found in the New Testament. She was at the temple when Jesus was brought for presentation. We're told in the passage that Anna was a woman who was well advanced in years, which means she was very old. And she had been a widow for many years, but she had dedicated herself to the service of the Lord. And in particular, it says that she was given to fastings, to prayer, and to the giving of thanks. And as a woman like that, Margie was knew the Lord, but she was blessed by the Lord as well. And there's just a couple of blessings that I wanted to mention before I pray today. Two weeks ago today, I had the opportunity to visit her in the hospital over in uh, O'Fallon. And uh, I arrived, and shortly thereafter, they were going to discharge her, so I thought I'd wait for, for Manny and Linda to get there. And so I thought I'd make good use of my time. So I asked her a couple of questions, and she told me the stories about how she came to Canada. She told me the story about how she and Harry made their way to, to California. And I was reminded during our conversation that the Lord had blessed her with a very sharp mind. Um, these details were just etched and they were just right there. It was just like yesterday for her. The other thing that I was reminded of though how God had blessed her was that she was a woman well advanced in years. Annually as we gather as a family for the reunion, she wanted to make sure everybody in the family knew what birthday she was celebrating. <laughs> this was an important thing to her. And that was a blessing that God gave her all those years. But it wasn't so much about that as it was about the family that was a blessing. Not having children of her own, she had dedicated herself to caring and being mindful of everyone else, and that was indeed a blessing to and through her. And that's why the next one I think is so important. She was a woman of joy. I, I don't remember a time ever seeing her discouraged or down. Always had a smile and always took time to come up to you and to talk to you. She didn't wait for others. She always was assertive about making sure that she wanted you to know that her life was filled with joy. The reason that was true is because of the, the most important blessing that comes to my mind. She knew the Lord. God had given her faith. God had given her new life. And from that flow, for years and years, consideration not only of, of turning her thoughts to her Lord and Savior, but also to those around her and being mindful of them. So today, I think it's more than appropriate that we should celebrate life. More than appropriate that we should sing I best of Fergus to so go. Because indeed, she knew the Lord to be her mighty God, her mighty fortress. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. There is nothing that takes place in this life apart from what you have ordained, not only for the good of your people, but for your glory. You are pleased to take my aunt and form and fashion her within the womb so many years ago to be a particular, a special individual. Most importantly, Lord, you call her to yourself that she might be one of your children and give a life here on this earth, one that was filled with delight and happiness, but more importantly, filled with joy and with purpose, and one that was filled with being mindful of others. So today, Lord, we want to give you thanks, for her journey has not ended. Uh, our, our time is now filled with a degree of mourning and sadness, but oh, thank you, Lord, that hers is filled with renewed joy. As she woke in your presence and saw you face to face, and faith was turned to sight. 
Thank you, Lord, that the scripture is true, that nothing can separate us from your love in your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you now, Lord, that she's entered into your eternal rest. And we look forward to the day, Lord, that we will be with her as well, with you, forever to rejoice. And Lord, be mindful of her desire for her family. I would ask of you, God, today, if there's someone here gathered who doesn't know you, that you be pleased to overwhelm them with your grace, that you would call them to yourself, that they would wake up right now from their spiritual deadness and confess that your Son, Jesus Christ, is Lord to your glory. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And thank you for my Aunt Marty. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Scripture teaches us to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth, demonstrating divine love all around us so that everyone may know the peace that we have found in Christ. And as far as I can tell, this is how Margaret lived her life. Many of us have received those handwritten notes and cards from Margaret. I don't know if she ever realized how meaningful those cards really were to each of us who received them. And I get a sense that Margaret was not the type to haphazardly just jot down some words and put it in an envelope. I think she deliberately and thoughtfully chose her words every time she wrote a card. Even for those who may not have had the privilege of receiving one of Margaret's cards, I doubt there's a person here today who doesn't know Margaret's gentle and welcoming smile, a smile that exuded warmth and respectful compassion. I think Margaret probably smiled maybe even when she didn't feel like smiling because she knew that she was to live as the light of the world, the salt of the earth, bringing God's joy to those around her. As we remember Margaret, I'm reminded of the old saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. God knows Margaret endured more than lemons or her fair share of lemons. But because of Margaret's steadfast desire to spread God's joy and cheer, because I know Margaret believed deeply in her soul that Christ was with her, I don't think Margaret just made lemonade when she got lemons. When life gave Margaret lemons, she made lemon pie, lemon bars, lemon sauce, <laughs> lemon muffins, lemon pudding, lemonade, and then she would invite others to come share in these joys because this was her personality, at least as I experienced it in the church. Margaret was the type that always looked for the good in everything. She didn't just survive her hardships, she thrived. She thrived because she was led by her faith. God reminds us through the word in Ecclesiastes that for everything there is a season, Time for everything, every matter under the heavens. There's a time to be born, a time to die. Unfortunately for us, God's timing is rarely in line with our own timing. We will always wish for one more opportunity to hold Margaret's hand or to see her smile. We will always wish for one more handwritten note. There will always be feelings of sadness because we weren't ready to let go of Margaret. In these times of sadness and grief, we find comfort in prayer and in scripture. We find comfort sharing stories together as family and friends. We find comfort in the fact that even though Margaret has left this world, her soul lives with God in heaven. Her legacy lives along her family and her memories live with us all. In the gospel lesson I read a moment ago from John, Jesus was preparing his disciples for his own departure. And in his farewell discourse, he left them with a promise, a promise that endures through the generations. I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. This is the greatest promise of our faith, a promise that life does not end at death. In fact, death is only the beginning of what's next. And as a people of faith, we know that what awaits us is to be in the very presence of God and in the company of all who have died in the faith before us. I am somewhat embarrassed to admit that in the five years I've been Margaret's pastor, I learned almost no German whatsoever. <laughs> but you can't leave Highland without seeing the phrase Auf Wiedersehen painted on the back of the Welcome to Highland signs. Maybe you'll notice that as you leave town today. I know we use Wiedersehen to say goodbye, but it's my understanding from my German teacher here that Auf Wiedersehen literally translates to until our reunion that we may see each other again. So I think it would be quite appropriate to remember Margaret by saying, Danke schön und Auf Wiedersehen. Amen. Amen. If you would stand as you're comfortably able, we'll sing together our final hymn, hymn number 493, It is Well With My Soul, verses 1, 3, and 4.
go with Margaret to her final resting place. Let us pray. Eternal God, let your mercy rest upon us as we with grateful affection remember our sister Margaret, who has departed this life. We thank you for her days upon the earth and the joy she brought to so many. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our sister. Let our faith be our consolation and life our eternal hope. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our sister Margaret, who was reborn by the water and the spirit in holy baptism. Grant that her death may recall to all of us your victory over death, and be for us an occasion to renew our trust and our faith. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow you where you have led the way. All of these things we pray in your name. Amen. Go in peace, and may the blessings of God the Creator, Christ the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit become.